A reminder, everything you need to participate this morning outside of hymns is found in your worship bulletin. We make our beginning. <clears throat> Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory is God. But when Reuben heard it, 
he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way down to carry it to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brothers and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the, to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Psalm 105, read responsively by whole verse. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous words. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Wonders in the judgment of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham's servant, O children of Jacob, his servant. Then he called the famine in the land and destroyed the supply of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in fetters, his neck they put in an iron collar. Until those predictions came to pass. Sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He set him as a master over his household, as a ruler over all his possessions. To instruct his princes according to his will and teach his elders wisdom. Hallelujah. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that mm -hmm. comes from the law. That the person who does these things will not live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your hearts, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. <coughs> or, Who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ down from death. But what does it say? The word is in you, on your lips and in your heart. That is, the word is of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, you will be saved. For one who believes with the heart that is so justified, and one confesses with the mouth and is so saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord for all and is generous to all who call on him. For Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they, they to call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how are they, they to believe in the one whom so they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, have you for the feet of those who bring us good news? Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and reached out his hand. He became frightened and be beginning to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God, the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, the Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In my former life, I played at hundreds of youth gatherings and youth worker events. And I've heard dozens of preachers use this gospel story to berate people into bad theology. I have heard tons of speakers turn this story into one about Jesus condemning Peter and ridiculing him for his lack of faith. Over and over, I have heard the point that this gospel text is for us, the point of this gospel text is for us all to somehow get more faith than Peter so that Jesus won't embarrass us for our lack of faith. That is not right. That is turning this text on its head. And no surprise, making it about ourselves rather than about Jesus. Using this story to tell people they have to measure up, try harder, straighten up and fly right, get more faith. And as I've said many times to you over the past few months, when we make the stories about Jesus into stories about ourselves, it always ends badly. <laughs> so, I am here this morning to set the record straight. Our takeaway from this text should not be, if Peter had only had more faith, he would not have sunk. Nor should our takeaway be, Jesus is criticizing Peter for not having more faith than Peter has. Nor should you pay attention to anyone who says or writes, if you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat. <laughs> so let's start here. The Bible did not drop out of the sky into our pew racks, fully formed in its final state. The original texts were mostly written in Hebrew and Greek, which is why people in seminary have to take those languages or used to have to take those languages. If you want to know what the writers of the New Testament actually wrote, it is crucial to have at least some familiarity with Greek. And this is a case where looking at the Greek gives you a completely different understanding of the story. That happens sometimes. And the key to getting this particular story right turns on one Greek word which I promise only to say once. And that word is alagapaste. That's the word that gets translated, you of little faith. Or in the King James, ye of little faith. And we're so familiar with that phrase that we use it in our everyday language. Like when someone is doubting whether I can sink a basketball from half court or what have you. You do something amazing or surprising, or you take on some big challenge, you might turn to your friend and say, ye of little faith, just watch. Which is just a stone's throw from hold my beer. 
But that is misunderstanding this text and what Jesus is saying. That little word, the one I promised only to say once, is an adjective turned into a noun. The word means little faith, and it's one word. Jesus is calling Peter little faith, like a nickname or a term of endearment. My little faith one. It is not a judgment. It is not a criticism. It is a comfort. It is reassuring. And that is why I have been driven crazy for so long at hearing others turn this text upside down, making Jesus into a scolding demigod who walks on water and ridicules a mere human who cannot do the same. Jesus does not mock his little faith ones. He does not taunt us for not being Jesus. And you know why he doesn't? Because faith itself is a gift from God. Faith is granted to us by God's grace, not because we deserve it. And besides, what kind of God criticizes people for not having enough of what only God can give them? It makes no sense. We must be careful not to turn faith into a competition where the good people get a bunch of faith and the bad people don't get any. We're already living in a system that views morality this way. Good people get more good stuff as a reward, and bad people go to jail because they're bad. That is the way of the world. That is not the way of God. Faith is a gift. We cannot get more of it by trying harder. Jesus says, my little faith one, why did you doubt? Aha, you may be saying. See, Jesus is judging Peter for his doubt, which is what caused him to fall into the sea. Maybe, but actually no. I don't think so. Because notice what comes right before that. As Peter begins to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus does. What Peter is doubting is not his ability to walk on water. I mean, he was just doing that for crying out loud. That little faith one was totally walking on water. Amazing. But when he begins to sink, he panics. He screams out because he does not trust Jesus to save him. That is Peter's doubt. Peter panics because he doubts Jesus' willingness or ability to save him. And so obviously, Jesus yells at him, right? No, of course not. I mean, would you yell at your beloved little faith one? Imagine you're teaching your beloved child to ride a bike. She goes a little bit, and she starts to fall sideways, panics, and screams out to you. And you catch her before she falls and gets hurt. You might say to her, my little biker, why did you doubt that I would catch you? What you would not say is, you of little bike riding ability, why did you fall? <laughs> you see how different that is. My little faith one, why did you doubt? It is caring and reassuring. And maybe more importantly, it is not Jesus saying, you got this, and watching you fall with his arms folded and shaking his head. Not even close. Rather, it is Jesus saying, I got you, and lifting you up. When you fall, I've got you. Jesus does not call us to have the faith to walk on water, or pick up sticks, or cast out demons. What Jesus calls us to do is to trust him. Trust him to save us when we are sinking below the waves. Trust Him to save us when we all eventually sink below the earth. Jesus will reach down for each one of us and pull us up to the resurrected new life. Do not doubt it, my friends. But of course, we do doubt it. And that's the best part, actually. Because doubts don't stop Jesus from saving Peter. Jesus still reaches down and pulls him up. 
Peter's fear and doubt do not stand in the way of God's salvation. Just as your fears and doubts cannot stop Jesus from saving you when you need him most, Jesus will lift up you and me, his little faith ones, and welcome us with open arms. And I also want to know, Jesus was coming to the disciples. He was on his way. When people say, if you want to walk on water, you have to get out of the boat, you should turn to them and say, no thanks. Why on earth would you get out of the boat when Jesus is on his way to you? Peter's challenge to Jesus, saying, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water, is ridiculous. <laughs> and it also sounds a lot like, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Lord, if it is you, command the other disciples to hold my beer. <laughs> Peter, little faith guy, just stay in the boat, okay? Jesus is coming. Now, I can almost guarantee you that at some point in your life, someone is going to use this story about Jesus and Peter as a way to say, if you would only feed pe people when they are hungry, or comfort those who mourn, or teach a child about Jesus, Jesus calls to us like he called to Peter. And the things we do together as the people of God are no less miraculous than Peter walking on the water. Sure, we too have our doubts, our anxieties, our fears. We will have moments when we think we are beyond redemption, beyond forgiveness, beyond help. And in those moments, Jesus reaches down to us and says, little faith one, why did you doubt? And this morning, Jesus reaches down in a different way, as he does every time we gather together in this place. And in the bread and wine, he offers the assurance that he is with us in body and blood, given for you. As we gather at this altar to celebrate the eternal feast with the saints of every time and place, we bring our doubts and our fears and our concerns for the future. And to each one of us, Jesus says, my little faith one, do not doubt. I have redeemed you and you are mine. Stay in the boat. I am coming to meet you right where you are. We profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, which you will find in your bulletin. We believe in one God.
Let us gather together our prayers for the church and the world, saying, God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We offer prayers for the universal church, that we may be the body of Christ in this world. We pray especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, Anne, our bishop, and George, our rector, that they would be clear proclaimers of your gospel and faithful ministers of your sacrament. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We offer prayers for the leaders of the nations and all in authority, that they would use their influence for the common good and the benefit of all people. We pray especially for Joseph, our president, Michael, our governor, and Kathy, our mayor, that they would pursue equality and justice for all people. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We offer prayers for your creation, that all your creatures might live as you intend. We pray that you would make us good stewards of the world you have entrusted to us, and guide us to find solutions to the destruction we have wrought. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We offer prayers for the victims of natural disaster, especially the people of Maui, that you would comfort them in their loss and console them with your presence. We pray for the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, that they would know peace and security. We pray for the victims of gun violence and ask that you would lead us to find workable solutions despite our disagreements. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We offer prayer for all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. We pray that you would bring healing to those in need, especially Roger and Gloria. Eve, Karen, Crystal, John, Chris, John, and Bobby, Lori, Patty, Tim, Ingrid, and Janine, and those on our continuing prayer list. Comfort also those we now name with our lips and in our hearts. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. We offer prayers to those who have died, that they would be welcomed into your loving embrace. And we pray that you would keep us ever mindful of the promise of resurrection, which is ours through Christ Jesus. God of love and mercy, hear our prayer. Grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of this land, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease, that our divisions be healed, we may live in justice and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God.
Please be seated for a few announcements. If you would like to make a flower memorial or dedication, please call the church office. We have lots of openings for flowers for the rest of this year. Today's flowers are given to the glory of God in loving memory of their father, Will Miller, and in honor of their parents, Will and Muffy Miller's 50th wedding anniversary by Megan and Stephanie and their families. We are exploring all options for the piano at this point, uh, from buying a brand new one, to buying a very good used one, to doing a massive overhaul of the current one. First and foremost, we want to do what is best for the parish and ensure that we are good stewards of the piano fund that you have entrusted to us. We will keep you informed as things move along. We are forming a committee <laughs> to do an in-depth review of the options for the parking lot doors in an effort to avoid controversy over this issue. The committee will be charged with looking at the door options, several of which we already have bids for, but this will also include security, the canopy awning, handicap accessibility, and other things as well, including, of course, aesthetics. If you are interested in serving on this committee, please speak to me or Jay Spencer or anyone on Vestry. Sooner is better. We would like for this committee to start meeting before the end of August. So if you're interested, this is your chance to get your input into the conversation. With the choir off during the summer, we always like to hear beautiful voices, and they're rare over the summer. So at our 10 o'clock service, we, uh, two weeks ago, we had Melody Moore, three weeks ago, whatever that was, uh, Melody Moore was here. And today, we have our very own Suzanne Woods to sing an anthem for us uh, during the offertory. Uh, two weeks from now, we will have tenor John Pickle singing. So, choir is not in session, we still have beauty among us. Uh, and then choir will be reforming maybe second week in September or so. Uh, and then one last thing, birthdays this week, this very day, Jay Spencer is having a birthday, as is our office administrator, Andy Digger, and uh, John Bolba, who has moved away, but is still much beloved among this parish. So on the back of your bulletin, you'll see the birthday prayer. Let's pray together for Jay, Candy, and John. Watch over thy children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts may thy peace which passeth understanding abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. Uh, and one last thing. Uh, we're into week two of using the trial use liturgies. I'm very pleased that some of you came back. Um, <laughs> we'll only be using these through the month of August. We may bring them back in Lent. We'll see. But just... You know, white knuckle it to the end of August, and then we'll go back to the book. I promise. In the meantime, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
body of Christ.
life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make the journey with us. So be swift to love, and make haste to be kind. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Love and serve the Lord. Thanks.